Do you watch movies? Do you listen to the radio? Do you cook? Yeah, me neither. <laughs> Do you sing to your kids before bed? My, oh my, what a wonderful day. Do you read them books? Arts empower us on a daily basis. As an artist living with brain cancer, it's my passion. I've been lucky. The arts gave me a career, arguably. <laughs> we are all empowered by the art that surrounds us every day. Art empowers us to learn more about ourselves. The arts empowered me to find my voice. Art makes me feel privileged. It takes me away. Ultimately, the arts affect me. It gives me joy. This is about supporting and empowering the arts and communities that need it most. Support the arts. Art has the power to empower. Power to empower. Power to empower. Tonight, the Creative Coalition presents This Ain't Your Average Duck Show. Hi, everybody. I'm Tim Daly, president of the Creative Coalition. Welcome to Not Your Average Talk Show. And it's not going to be average, I assure you. We're going to have a great time. For those of you that don't already know about the Creative Coalition, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization founded by prominent members of the arts and entertainment community who believe that it's our responsibility to use this unique platform that we've been given to educate, inspire, and motivate our audiences and ourselves to mobilize around issues of public importance, primarily arts advocacy and public funding for arts and arts education. It's our mission to promote, protect, and defend the arts as a basic human need. And I wanna make clear, we're not an organization that only supports artists. We believe that every human being, and especially every child, should be exposed to and participate in the arts not so they can become professional artists, but because we know that it will enrich their lives and make them better, more imaginative, more creative, more productive, more successful human beings. There's a lot of data that bears that out, so it's true. So in the world as we find it right now, we're in a lot of trouble. We have this horrible pandemic that's sweeping the globe. We have environmental issues that need our desperate attention. We have social unrest that needs our attention. So why should we focus right now on supporting the arts? I'll tell you why. Can you imagine trying to get through this without arts, without the television shows and movies that we love that we're streaming all the time, without books, without music, without dance, without all those things that give us joy that at best enlighten us and at the very least entertain us, it would be impossible. Arts are the common language of our humanity and they need our support and our attention right now. So please enjoy yourselves tonight and I'm gonna throw it over to our CEO, Robin Bronk, who's going to give you a little more info about how things will proceed. Thanks, Tim. That's my president. I just love saying that. I'm Robin Bronk, CEO of the Creative Coalition. The Creative Coalition is the nonprofit, nonpartisan charity arm of the entertainment industry. Our members are actors, writers, producers, directors, executives in the entertainment industry, as well as fine artists. And we exist to ensure that everyone, every citizen has the right to the arts. They have their right to bear arts. We also exist through donations to ensure that schools and communities around the nation have funds to access the arts. That's what we do. We're only here to make sure that you have the arts. So in the name of a mentor that you might have that brought arts into your life, or in honor of that picture that's hanging on your refrigerator from your son or daughter, we urge you to make any donation so that we can continue to ensure that the arts are part of your life. Why are we here tonight? What's gonna happen? You'll meet the celebrities whom you love to watch and the people whom you didn't know before tonight are spectacular individuals in their own right, who all happen to have a rare and aggressive form of cancer, glioblastoma, brain cancer. They are receiving treatment by a wearable, portable, FDA approved medical device made by Novacure, our partner for tonight. Now we're all getting used to meeting new people over Zoom. Me, I keep meeting the new wrinkles in my neck. 
but we are forming bonds and relationship with people who, ne who we've never met in person. I can tell you that as someone who meets with new people all the time on Zoom, I often find myself feeling like I have my own talk show. And that's where the idea for tonight's event came from. The idea that we're, we're all just talking and being real and open and honest. We're at our most vulnerable and we find ourselves most connected. Welcome to tonight's show. Hey guys, Eliza Schlesinger here and the Creative Coalition has asked me to give you some helpful pointers on being the perfect talk show guest. Follow along and you'll come out of this tutorial, the perfect talk show guest. First of all, Remember, there's a lot of celebrities they could be interviewing, so be gracious. Um, the movie was a total turd, and I'm contractually obligated to be here. Also remember, they've got to go to commercial, so keep your stories poignant and short. And then when I was five, are you with me? We moved to Denver. Now fast forward about a week. This is a lot of people's first time seeing you, so wear something fun. <laughs> remember, the world is watching, so try to keep it neutral. If I could just weigh in on a foreign country where I don't pay taxes, do your best to remain likable. Well, speaking as a woman, go to commercial. We all love our pets, but try not to be weird about your dog. <laughs> Remember to make your stories personal and it wouldn't stop oozing blood. So it's 310, all green rooms have alcohol. Don't take the free drinks, it's a trap. I don't like Beyonce or Betty White. I said it in America. I'm gonna leak my nudes to TikTok. Remember to have fun and be comfortable. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, I'm JB. In the past decade, I've become very passionate about beach volleyball. I've found it to be a fun way to stay active, get some sun, meet new people, and feed my competitive spirit. My brother and I have started a board game collection and have hosted game nights with friends. We play anything ranging from fun party games that anyone can learn right away to complex nerdy board games where every move must be carefully calculated. I'm also a bit of a comedy nerd. I enjoy watching a wide range of comedians do stand-up as I, and I listen to comedy podcasts now and then. In January of 2015, I was diagnosed with glioblastoma, the most aggressive form of brain cancer. I had a tough journey leading up to the diagnosis. Once I became symptomatic with headaches and neck pain, I knew something was serious. So I moved home with my dad and my brother, and they tried their best to help me find out what was going on. As my symptoms worsened, I was finally admitted to a new hospital for testing, and the MRI revealed a tumor. Within 48 hours, I was recovering from brain surgery. I was very fortunate to have a great medical team as well as friends and family that have supported me to this day. I'm in awe of everyone's resilience to help me through this. As of now, my day-to-day -day life is very relaxing. My dog Rigby and my cat Luna keep me company and help me maintain my sanity. I'm also able to engage in virtual speaking events to share my story and speak about my condition. Post COVID, it will be nice to get together and reunite with friends. I'll definitely have a renewed appreciation for life as we once knew it. Hi, I'm JB and this is the JB Comedy Show. Disclaimer, this may or may not be funny. Our guest tonight is one of America's most beloved comedians, Bob Saget. JB, thank you, thank you. I'm so honored to talk to you. Um, yeah. And the Creative Coalition is uh, dear to my heart. And you've, you've been through a lot, right? Yeah, I'm a, a long-term cancer survivor right now. I've gone on uh, five years now of fighting a glioblastoma, which is brain cancer. Well, bless you and bless your brain. <laughs> well, I just want to say I'm doing really well and I'm like super excited to talk to you. So let me hop into a question real quick here. Rumor okay. has it that you set out in college to be a doctor. What made you take the left turn into show business? It's weird because I was in the middle of surgery and then someone said, do you want to be in comedy? So I stopped operating on someone's heart and just, yeah, okay. So um, I was just dumb. I, I, I w wanted to be a doctor because of, my dad had a doctor that kind of helped save his life. He had heart attacks when he was 40 and 42 and I wanted to help people. That's what I really wanted to do. I actually wanted to be a pediatric surgeon. That's very noble of you to want to be into like the medical world. I think there's a lot of great people that help people out there. It's like near sure. my heart, of course. Well, I also read something that you said, and I, I just loved it. And it inspired me right away. And that it's learned to love and value every person and every moment in your life. So many things. I feel like I'm just echoing like words I hear that'll just um, help people in their adventure through life. Um, everyone's going through a battle with something. You don't know what people are going through. So yeah. Sometimes I just echo some words of wisdom that might help people. 
I'm more interested. Also, you have a, a, a dog named Rigby and a cat named Luna. That kind of excites me. Yes, um, they sort of help me through a lot of what I'm going through. So I'm very fortunate to have them as my support team, as well as my brother and my dad who helped me along the way. But yeah, I'd probably be insane if it wasn't for my my dog, who also I I interview on regular occasions as well. You you interview them just uh, in in the house or or on uh, on streaming or or uh, on, we sort of we have Zoom calls where we meeting of the mind sort of thing bounce ideas right. off from and every, yeah. And and I know your mom also has been having quite a battle with uh, MD. She actually had passed away when I was at a young age, so oh. that was something. I'm I know you're also no stranger to loss, and I think it affects everyone when they lose a family member. I think it also maybe shaped why I got into comedy in the first place. Um, I think you kind of deal with and cope with those things through a bit of comedy. Did you, have you done stand up? I've never gotten into stand up. People have told me I should try. I think it'd be really interesting because I know what your first five minutes would be. They'd be about, they'd be about where you're at in your life yes. and sharing your experience and to find the humor and through difficulty. That's where a lot of humor comes from. So. Okay. And I share a lot of my humor. This is where people find my comedy is like, I'll share my stories on Facebook and stuff. And I always, when I give people updates, I always put a bit of comedy in it to give an example. I might be like, uh, my neuro-oncologist recently read my latest MRI. Good news, no sign of a brain. And then be like, woohoo, three more months of being a scarecrow or something like that. So I always keep this fun and silly and like light, even though we're dealing with a very difficult topic of like brain cancer and Unfortunately, there's a lot of people who have to fight this type of brain cancer and the, I use comedy to get me through it and sometimes it helps them as well, but it's a very serious disease, of course, so it's like I know um, it's good to bring the attention to it and it's not, a, it's not really a laughing matter, but it helps me. It's important. It's not important to laugh at it, but it's important to laugh through it. So is, is there an episode of Full House that stands out in your mind as one of the most challenging or that you're most proud of? doing the the show where it had touching moments and i think it unified families and that's why tv numbers were up and people really loved it was they could watch it with their parents or people had lost a parent and would say to me that show that particular one where you address the death of the mom with dj was incredibly meaningful to me so that makes it more meaningful for me as well and then other ones where we just did high style comedy was very fun like when um accidentally Candace and um, Scott Wanger, uh, DJ and Steve were in a cement truck, truck and they accidentally hit the lever and the, the cement poured into the kitchen. It always happens in the kitchen. And it was, you know, it was fun doing broad comedy in that Lucy kind of way because hers was always so physical and so genius. Right. And here, here we were having one of those moment, wannabe moments. So, and finally, very seriously, what's your favorite color? Blue. No question, it is blue. It always has been. It's not a political statement. Uh, it's the color of the water. It's the color of the sky. It's just my favorite color. Your hoodie is my favorite color. Woohoo, lucky choice. Yeah, you did exactly. You knew. You knew ahead of time. Well, I can't and thank you enough. And I want to thank the Creative Coalition, too, for putting us together. This was, yeah, this is a huge honor. Thank you so much, Bob. JB, honestly, this is my honor. This was uh, really special for me. Thank you as well. Hi everyone, it's Carrie Ann Yanaba here. Uh, my favorite part of being a talk show host is getting to know new people and getting to hear their stories and um, learning about the way other people think and the way other people do things. The ability to just allow yourself to be present in the moment and listen to somebody tell their story. And from that, you ask questions, whatever stirs your soul. It's so important to be authentic and people love to hear and feel real connection. So those would be my thoughts and I know you're all gonna be amazing. Open your heart, listen carefully and just talk. You're gonna be amazing. Have a great time. My name is Terry Durand and I was diagnosed with glioblastoma stage four in November of 2018. It was so incredibly scary for my whole family. I mean, it came out of the blue. I was perfectly healthy, a little cholesterol, but boom, 
to cancer, brain cancer, the worst brain cancer you can possibly get. I got it. I don't care. I'm gonna still have fun and paint my rocks and work in my garden and enjoy every little piece of life that I possibly can, All right? I like to paint rocks for the um, waiting room of my oncologist's office because when I was first diagnosed, I was uh, a mess, a scared, terrified mess. And I think finding a rock that said like hope, you know, I, that's what I put all nice messages on them. And it could give somebody a smile or hope. Anyhow, thanks for listening to my story. Hi, I'm Terry D and welcome to the Terry D Show. Today, our guest has won lots of awards and is a very established and talented actress and a wonderful person. Everybody welcome, Edie Falco. Yay, Edie. Here I am, and nice to meet you. You wanted to be an actor when you grow up. What, what made you decide to try that? That there was nothing else I liked to do as much as I liked this, you know? Uh, I had tried lots of other stuff and it was all fun, but there was something different about doing a play. And I thought, I don't know, imagine if I could do this forever. I mean, you could do the same thing with wine taster. <laughs> you could be wine tasters. <laughs> Indeed. So I wanted to ask you if, you followed a nurse around for the Nurse Jackie show because you really seemed at home. I did. I, were, I went to an emergency room. I went for one day, but I felt so out of place. Like I, I felt like these people are having the worst day of their life. And here I am like, oh, I'm an actress and I just kind of want to watch. What we did do is we had a wonderful uh, nurse from Bellevue Hospital here in New York, a woman named uh, Lisa Wing, who I adore. Uh, and she was on set with us all the time. What Nurse Jackie episode is your favorite? There was one where me and Thor, the character of Thor, who is uh, played by my dear friend, Stephen Wallum, we were tap dancing. But I thought to myself, whoever thought that doing a medical show would have a scene like this in it? <laughs> but uh, it was one of many, many fun scenes that we shot over the years, but that one sticks out in my mind. I've, I remember just uh, laughing for the, the large majority of the day. What was the most challenging episode that you had to deal with on Nurse Jackie? Any stuff with a lot of technical stuff was always a um, necessary part of the storytelling, but I, I didn't like them so much. I'm, I'm amazed at the character's depth. She is such a terrible druggie and a sneaky little shit, pardon me. <laughs> um, but she is so compassionate and caring and, and good. People seem to be more open now to seeing imperfect people on television. Instead of seeing people that always made you feel like, boy, I wish I was like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. people are ready to see characters that are more like themselves, where they can be basically good, but have some stuff that really just doesn't fit in that mold. Absolutely. You know what I mean? I'm getting cold again. Yeah, I hear you. Can you tell me about your favorite Sopranos episode? Tony keeps looking out his window and seeing a woman like hanging, hanging uh, laundry on a line or something. He kind of, and he sort of falls in love with this person. He's remembering his mom when he was little, little Tony remembering when life was simple. Yeah. And I wasn't in that episode much. I remember seeing it though and thinking, oh my God, you learn so much about him and uh, the storytelling was so interesting and... I want to know if it feels like a princess dressing up for all those awards shows. It's a lot of pressure because yeah. if left to my own devices, <laughs> I would wear jeans and a t-shirt to everything. And I know some women would love this. And, and even knowing that, I can just speak for myself that it's not my thing. You know what? We should all have a COVID dress up day and we'll deck ourselves out and have a huge Zoom meeting. That's hysterical. Oh my God. Good with, idea. With with a margarita. That's a celebration. Edie, I'm very curious what's next for you because I wanna look forward to it. Well, you're very sweet. I think I'm going to work with Ryan Murphy, who's a director, and I'm supposed to go to LA to work with him probably in November. All right, so most important, I really wanna ask you this, okay? Hold Are on. you ready? I believe so. What's your favorite color? Oh God, my favorite color, turquoise. <gasps> my daughter's. Really? 
Yes. I have a thing for like watery colors, like blue green kind of yeah. variations on it. Yeah. Edie, thank you so much coming on the Terry D show. My very first and most special guest. Oh, it's been a pleasure you. having you and it's been a pleasure meeting you, Edie. Thank you very much. Of course. And pleasure meeting you as well. So I'm really lucky because I wasn't just a co-host of The Talk for six years, but I also had my own podcast called Girl and Guy that I hosted for five seasons. So I got to interview a lot of cool people, uh, Chris Rock, Viola Davis, Charlize Theron, Tom Morello, my mom, my dad. Um, but I think the most memorable guest I ever got to interview was probably Oprah when she came on The Talk, I think in my last season there. And I think what was so memorable other than that it was Oprah was how generous of a guest she was and how kind. And I think um, interviews can be naturally very anxiety making, right? You're nervous, they're nervous, but the more you can welcome them into your space, you know, when you bring someone onto your talk show, it's like bringing them into your home, make them feel comfortable, the better interview you're gonna get. In fact, on my podcast, which was always just me and my guest in a room with no publicists or any other handlers, I would often have people say, oh, I've never told this story before, or, oh my God, I can't believe I'm saying this. And that was because I made them feel really relaxed and safe with me, and they felt like they could, you know, open up. So in your interviews, make your guests feel comfortable, make them feel at home, and you're probably gonna get something that you didn't expect. Go get them, guys. I'm rooting for you. Hey, beautiful people. My name is Major, and I have a song for you. You're not a burden, you're loved even more. Yesterday I loved you, today I think I love you even more. Yeah. Yesterday I needed you. Today, it feels like I need you even more. Even more than all the water in the sea, yeah. Even more than all the oxygen I breathe. Yesterday, I wanted you, now I know I want you even more, we say. Yesterday I loved you, now I know I love you even more, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yesterday I needed you Today I think I need you even more It's true Even more Than every star in midnight sky Even more Than an eternity of time Yesterday I wanted you, now I know I want you even more, say, listen, when you wrap your arms around me, it feels like home, love will take away my lonely, you're not alone. Yes, you are the very best thing And even better yeah. One of many blessings When we're together You're not a burden, you're loved You're not a burden, you're loved Yesterday I wanted you now I know I want you even more. Yes, I do.
My name is Major, and I approve that message. Hi, my name is Kate Strap Jones. Um, actually, my legal name is Kathleen Strap Jones, but you can call me Kathleen when you're mad at me, or you're my parents. They're since gone. Um, or if you don't like me, call me Kathy, which I, I'm not a Kathy. So I'm Kate. One of my favorite things to do is spend time with my family. Truly. I know that sounds silly, but there were so many years that um, we couldn't spend time together. So now I just, I like spending time with my boys, my one grandson, um, two of my sisters I left. I had three when passed in 2012. So family is really important to me. When did I get the diagnosis of GBM? Well, it was confirmed in July of 2018. Uh, oddly enough, it was just an eye issue at the time. And <laughs> within a couple of weeks, boom, 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 there it was. I have to say, the best support system I could have ever had was my husband, Pat. Um, I can't say enough nice things, especially because he's not in here, so his head's not going to get big. Um, he's been exceptional. He really has. I'm very fortunate to have him. Hi, everybody. My name is Kate, and this is Kate the Great Show. Yes! I love, I love that. <laughs> um, so... Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our guest. You guys are going to be amazed. Um, <laughs> she's one of the most versatile and compelling award-winning actresses in the entire world. <laughs> that's a really big... Oh! <laughs> Sarah Paulson. Yay! I'm pretending to be the studio audience. So. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. I mean, that is just... It's just awesome. I have to add that. That's just amazing. When did you first realize that you wanted to be an actor? I was just incredibly fascinated with movies and plays, and I was a huge reader. I was very dramatic. Now we haven't, we can't, you know, we could have a whole show on the psychological consequences of being told you're overly dramatic when really you're just having all your very big feelings and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they're very real for me. But, you know, I think as uh, my mother was very young mom, so she had me at about 21. So I'm sure there she had this, you know, four-year-old who was like, I want Cheerios. I need them, you know. I probably was looking for a healthy way to channel some of those feelings I, I had, which were um, sometimes quite overwhelming as a, as a young person. I think I probably came into the world not knowing that acting would be the thing that would help me pilfer out all this <laughs> emotional sediment. Is there anything from your past work as an actor that you wish you could redo? There's an, there's an interesting thing that happens when you're a performer and if you're lucky enough to get to do it in a way where you can make a living. But you have this experience of being able to watch it after the fact in a way that is quite um, unique in the sense that in other professions, you may not get to get a sort of hard copy of the work you did in a, in a, in a very real way for you to sort of watch and dissect. But sometimes as an actor, you sort of pick apart moments and go, oh, if I had known that I was doing that, I would, oh, I wish I could have done that moment again. And so it's, it's hard. It's very confronting. Um, so I think there are a million things that I've done where I think, oh, I would love to do that moment again. I wish I could have done that beat again. Um, but the main thing I feel actually is I wish I could go back and experience doing the thing again, having already done it. Tell us what your next thing is. The next project is the third installment of American Crime Story. The first one being People vs. O.J. Simpson. The second installment was the assassination of Gianni Versace. And the third installment is uh, the impeachment of Bill Clinton. And I'm playing Linda Tripp, 
And we were about to start shooting this in March when the shutdown happened. So oh. uh, there had to be a, a pause on that, which was hard because, you know, you spend a lot of time researching and sort of immersing yourself. And then it was sort of, I tried to keep up with the accent work and the Linda has a different uh, speech uh, tone of voice than I do. So I've been working with someone on that and I have a a couple of things that are that are um, brewing that I can't talk about yet because they're just, uh, but we will be doing a second season of Ratchet, which is great. You might have a pillow, like, stapled to the back <laughs> of the bed so maybe you can get some sleep every now and then with that kind of schedule. Come on. Kate, you know, I might have to make you make a phone call to uh, some of the executives to say, can you create a pillow, a walking bed for her? And then, yeah, and then every few times she just stops walking, you just got to let her sleep standing up for a second. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So the very last question, what's your favorite color? What's my favorite color? My favorite color is, um, it's my least favorite food, but my most favorite color, which is eggplant. That beautiful sort of aubergine purple, plum, plum purple eggplant color, lavender, that family. Eggplant to me is the worst food on the planet. I don't know why anybody eats it. I think it's truly vile. And I'm sorry if it's your favorite food, Kate. Oh, no. Asparagus is my absolute worst. You hate asparagus? Can I just tell you that I hated asparagus too, but I've come up with a way that I actually love asparagus. Mm. You're, not, you're not going for it. Mm. Mm. Listen, if you gave me an, uh, an eggplant recipe that you swore by, I wouldn't eat it either. So I understand. Eggplant's disgusting. Oh, it is. But you're right. The color... The it's color beautiful. is beautiful. What's your favorite color? Do you have a favorite color? You know, if I guess if I had to pick one out, it would have to be blue. Blue. Just because I've always loved blue. Yeah. I you know But you're not I, a kind of person who goes around going, give me that, you know, where everybody gives you blue sweaters or blue scarves for Christmas because you just love blue so much. Nah, you know, I'm really not artistic in the least. I don't I believe it. Sure, oh, no, I'm not. I'm seriously. I, my oldest, I had three older sisters. My oldest sister, Byrne, she's since passed in 2012. She was like this artist. She was an artist. Beautiful things. And the next sister, Chris, she uh, sewed and she did all these Susie Homemaker kind of stuff. <laughs> and then, and so, the next one, Mary, you know, she now cooks and does a, And I'm like, Bleh. Yeah, but Kate, can I just tell you something? You have a talk show. So like, <laughs> Kate the Great. Kate the Great's talk show is like must-see viewing. So I would just have to posit that you win that, that artistic contest. <laughs> I to me. Win. Well, I feel very, very grateful to have had an opportunity to meet you and talk to you. You're such a wonderful human being. Thank it's you. Very you nice are. to know that someone like you out there in the world is interested in what I'm doing it makes me every time I have that moment now where I feel like what am I doing this and who am I doing this for I'm doing it for Kate Kate yeah. the great Kate that's the great. what I'm doing it for <laughs> Kate. Right. thank you thank you I really really appreciate it it's Terry D again and I am lucky enough to have Rosie O'Donnell in the craft corner and we are going to make some rocks. Hi, Rosie. It's so nice to meet you. Hi, Terry. How are you? Oh, I'm great. I'm excited. Now show everybody what we're going to make today. We're going to make some rocks. I don't think we're going to do anything quite this perfect. Oh, look at that. Isn't this now, is one of my favorites? Are those stencils? Those were totally stencils. I bought a henna kit. Oh, yeah. And the henna stencils peel right off after you use them, can use them again. I tried to do these um, mandala paintings with the dots. Oh. They're yeah. so hard to do. Have you seen the people on YouTube? I would just use the end of my paintbrush and dot, dot, dot. That's how I make the dots on the ladybugs. Look what I got. I got all these to dot with. Do you do words ever on them? Oh, yes. Yeah. Because I, most of these, I, I save them up and I bring them to my oncologist's office and I leave them in the oncologist's office so that people who maybe, you know, have a terrible diagnosis might be, make them smile a little bit. So right. I do a lot of positive affirmations on them. When did you get sick, Terry? Um, 
November of 2018. And, and, and what was your diagnosis? GBM4, brain cancer. Not when fun. I go for something, I only go for the very best. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, what, what kind of a shock was that to your system? Rosie, it was so shocking and scary. I mean, I was perfectly healthy, a little cholesterol, and then, you know, I was starting to do funny things and act funny. The doctor did the test, squeeze my fingers, kick your foot, uh, you know. She sent me for an MRI, and before I knew it, a week later, I was in surgery. Were they able to shrink the tumor? It was as big as an orange. Mm -hmm. And my doctor said when it popped out, it popped out like an avocado seed. <laughs> really? Yeah, isn't it? We all have fruit tumors. Some people have lemons. <laughs> I only had it a couple of months. And so I was scared uh, about it coming back because it's sure. so aggressive. Right. And I, um, that's why my head is like this. Because I am fighting with every ounce of my being. Good, honey. As yep, you that's should. what you got to do. Right. Yep. I, I, you know what? Every morning is a gift and you have to open it and smile. Exactly right. Yes. Exactly right. Okay, look, I saw that you did words, so I made a little love one. Beautiful. Beautiful. And, and I was just messing around with the Mandela idea. Excellent. And I made yeah, a and then I, and then I was going to maybe make a blue ladybug. I don't know. Well, ladybugs are so cute. I love them. So Rosie, what would you say to someone who really wanted to try crafting but was nervous to start? Oh, I would say, please save yourself. No, crafting is like a life raft that shows up for me. I mean, I know that for a while my kids are like, mom, all we see is the top of your head and you doodling, you know? And it really, for me, keeps me sane, you know? Yeah. It, it really does. I feel like, you know, I put the, the flowers in the press and then I remember, okay, I have to do them tomorrow or let's see how the drying paint came out. Let's, and, you know, it gets you off of the catastrophe that we're living in. Oh, and we are living and in. And we are. We sure are. Okay, Rosie, I want to know what your favorite color today is. As a crafter, it changes, doesn't it? Well, I'm a girl who loves yellow. Oh my God. I just think it reminds me of everything I love. The sun, flowers, you know, it just, yellow makes me feel like God and hope and everything good in the world. So it's now and when I'm painting myself and using yellow is not my favorite color, but it is my favorite color. When I see it, it gives me a happy little ping, you know? Yes. And I want to thank you so much for joining me today in Terry's Craft Corner, Rosie. You've been a pleasure. Thank you, Terry. You too. All the love to you. Mwah. Bye, Bye, Rosie. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm John Cedar. Some of the favorite things that I like to do are rock climbing, painting, putting up murals, surfing, stand-up paddle boarding, really just being outside and being active. I got diagnosed with stage four glioblastoma on October 2nd, 2019. The day I heard the news, it seems kind of surreal, like a dream. I wasn't even entirely sure what it meant to have glioblastoma. Uh, I had actually asked the doctor, like, does that mean I have cancer? And of course they, uh, they said yes. My days vary. I do try and draw every day for at least 30 minutes. If I have a project going on or a mural to do, I'll be focusing on that. Especially when there are days when there are waves, I'll be out on the uh, lake surfing. My life has changed a bit. Since my diagnosis, I had to move back to Cleveland for treatment. I was living uh, with my girlfriend in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, but now we're back in Cleveland. I just have to kind of plan everything out more. It's not it's, it's just different, and I think that's, it's hard to really explain in words what exactly that means. My family and friends, I think, uh, they, were, they were pretty shocked. I, I wasn't acting like I was sick before I learned uh, what was going on. I actually had a seizure, and that's how they found out. I had a, um, a large tumor in my right frontal lobe. My support system um, is vast, and I'm very lucky uh, from 
you know, my family, uh, girlfriend, uh, to my, you know, my little brother who's in medical school. He tries to make every doctor appointment with me. Uh, I don't ask him to be there. He, he just wants to be there to support me. Um, along with my cousin, who is also a um, pediatric oncologist. Hi, I'm John Cedor, and this is The John Cedor Show. Our guest tonight is one of the funniest comedians in the world, as well as one of the palest comedians in the world. Please welcome Jim Gaffigan. Thank you, John. It's good to be here. I, uh, I'm here wearing my On Golden Pond hat. It appears that I'm doing this from a steakhouse, based on the backdrop, but this is just a house that uh, we rented so that my kids could run outside. If you could interview anyone, who would it be? Besides you? Um, <laughs> if I could interview anyone. I want to interview the person that will have the solution to bring this country together. Because I miss, I, I'm from Indiana, but I've always enjoyed having very eclectic friends. Like I've always sure. enjoyed having friends of different opinions. And, and I feel like that's slipping away. And I think that whoever that person is that's gonna bring it back together, uh, he or she is somebody that is someone that I'd like to talk to. I wanna talk to them because it'll give me hope. If you were to create another series, uh... I guess, who would you like to work with if you could pick any uh, actor or other comedian? I, I don't know if I would create another show because I think what I've learned is, um, you know, just as there's people that love to direct and maybe I'll, you know, maybe if you asked me in a year, it would, I'd have a different answer, but I don't want that many responsibilities. Like I want to, you know what I mean? I want to be, yeah. I would, I mostly want to do uh, projects where I can be different people. Do you know what I mean? Like I love, uh, that's why I really enjoy indie films is you go in and there, no one's there for a financial incentive everyone's there for this incredible sacrifice. I've spent some time teaching art to kids, um, and I've actually uh, been pretty surprised by what kids can come up with and create. Um, are your kids creative in any ways? Yes, it's fascinating for me to see how it comes out in different ways. I could go through each of my kids. It's just a different kind of creative uh, a facet to them that is very unique. And it almost makes me think that as we get older, you know, culturally or society encourages us to dampen that, that creative outlet. And I would still say I'm establishing myself as a visual street artist and stuff. That's actually what I'm doing right now down in Chattanooga is a mural. And so this mural, what, can you tell me about it? like what inspired it or like was it an assignment or was it something that you pitched? I guess uh, to bring it full circle, kind of like your wife, I learned uh, actually almost to the day a year ago that I had uh, glio stage four glioblastoma brain cancer. You know, since my diagnosis, I've put up five murals. Wow. Um, and it depends, you know, some of them come from businesses, some of them through friends, friends of friends. Um, the one I'm doing in Chattanooga is uh, for a buddy of mine I met through rock climbing. He makes prosthetics. And so he started his, uh, or I guess he started a company down here. And he, it's a new space, wanted something colorful to give people hope. I'm an arm amputee myself. I lost my hand about 13 years ago. So I had to learn to create right-handed. And, and to be honest, uh, Jim, you know, art saved my life. I mean, like, after I lost my hand, I had 12 weeks before going to art school to be right-handed. And it, yeah, I mean, even through the cancer stuff, I mean, I draw every day. Um, and I keep trying to push myself, but I, it's for me because it makes me feel alive. It, and it, almost like how maybe your comedy is cathartic or if somebody writes in a journal, for me, that's what helps me process. I'm trying to give people hope. Like, your life's not over because you're missing a leg now. 
Right. In right. fact, it could just be beginning. And I would say I wouldn't have had a lot of opportunities in my life if my accident didn't happen. And I think it's just important to keep that perspective. Um, so I, I actually taught street art to, in an inner city high school for two years. And the way I'd always present it to my students was um, this is like the beauty of like street art, uh, public art, whatever you want to call it, is that you don't know how far the impact will have. What is your favorite color, Jim? Uh, it's, I get that question a lot. I like blue, and I think it's because I'm a pale guy, and I think that blue is a color I can safely wear where it won't look silly. Well, Jim, it honestly was awesome to talk with you. Uh, really cool to hear kind of your insights and uh, pick your brain about life in general. Uh, thank you so much for spending this time with me, taking the time out of your day. Thank you so much. And thank you for uh, doing this also. And I'm really excited to see the mural in Chattanooga. You know, that'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah, I'll and be uh, taking some photos today of it. So. In Cleveland, you got to eat a Polish dog, a Polish boy for me, right? I'll do my best. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ryan, and I live in Los Angeles, California, and I have brain cancer. I went to the emergency room on Sunday, August 28, 2016, in San Francisco. At the time, I was working there for a few weeks. On my last weekend there, my wife Meg and my daughter Skylar, who was two years old at the time, came and visited me from Los Angeles, but went back home that Sunday afternoon. I was officially diagnosed September 20, 2016, right after surgery that day. They removed 100% of the visible tumor, and it was stage four brain tumor, which is malignant and called glioblastoma, or GBM. Since then, as I've recovered physically, I enjoy what I think are simple things in life. I also go to a cancer support group to share feelings and thoughts about our cancer. And as far as driving, I can drive just fine, and I've never had seizures but I do have an increased risk of having them. So my wife and I decided that I can't drive her or our daughter at all. However, my wife is continuing to be my greatest supporter. Her impact is enormous. She's my wife, my caregiver, a great mother to our child, breadwinner, and administrator of my legal and medical issues. I'm fortunate she works hard to do it all. It makes me appreciate that I have that support. Since the pandemic, it's been challenging, especially since I have brain cancer. But I was able to be my daughter's teacher for about 11 weeks earlier this year. My wife, my daughter, and myself all got new bikes and we enjoy going out together, which is, isn't that often. But I also use my bike for exercising. Because of the pandemic, it made me appreciate what me and my family were able to do since my diagnosis. And because of that, I can't wait until we're able to do that all over again such as going to Disneyland, watching baseball and basketball games, going back to the gym, driving out of town. I really haven't thought about anything new to do when the pandemic ends, but I will enjoy doing what I was doing before that and appreciate it even more. Hi, I'm Ryan, and this is The Ryan J Show. Our guest tonight charmed the socks off of Mrs. Maisel and played a kid superhero in Shazam. Please welcome Zachary Levi. <laughs> You've got it, brother. You got it. Ryan, okay. thank you so much for uh, having me on your talk show. I am, I am honored. My very first question, of course, is how soon and why did you want to be an actor or a singer? I think when I was about four, I was the first time I was old enough to consciously be cognizant of the idea that I could, I could intentionally make somebody laugh. I can intentionally entertain somebody, not like on accident. We always do that as kids. We do something and people laugh and like, what did, what did I do? I don't know. But then around four, I was cognizant. I could do it on purpose. And then once I figured out that I could do that on purpose and it made somebody feel good, you know, if you make somebody laugh, that makes them feel good. And that made me feel good. And I was like, oh, this is just, I'm addicted to this. I can't stop doing this. Have you ever dabbled in acting or singing at all? I was kind of a shy person and okay. um, my daughter, she's six years old, not like me. So I'm happy. Uh, she, maybe she might look into um, being more outgoing and 
she loves to sing. There's definitely this thing of, all right, I'm going to go shoot myself out of a rocket and be right in front of God and everyone and all of their gazes and all of their judgments and then hopefully all of their praise and validation. You know, it's uh, artists are really weird people. <laughs> Well, you grew up that way at a very young age. So it's not something that you just switched on. It just happens. So that's awesome. I am aware of um, your shows, Chuck to Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And for Chuck, would you consider that your breakthrough TV show? Or is it something before that or even after that? Even though I had worked a little bit before Chuck, that was, I would definitely say, was my break. But really, Shazam has done that even more so. So going back to Shazam, did you um, do your own stunts at some level or? I mean, it was a little bit of both. You know, I, I'm the type of actor that really likes doing as many of my own stunts as they let me do. But then there's just stuff that legally I'm not allowed to do because yeah, it's too dangerous. If you were an actor, would you want to do your own stunts or would you be like, no, that's cool. I'll let somebody else. No, at some it. level. Yeah, I, I totally understand now that you brought that up. Yeah, at some level, I want to be kind of involved in that way, um, yeah. obviously some limitations of course now for shazam for example and other movies or tv shows did you have to like exercise i had worked out i had done some some um you know reasonably arduous uh um workout regimens prior to shazam but i had never jumped into bodybuilding and health and wellness on the level that i did when i actually then got the role how would Shazam handle quarantine. I mean, fly around, you know, handed out masks. He'd um, electro el electrically charge the air around people in a way that it would zap all of the coronavirus uh, and but not hurt them at all. Like he just do things like that. He'd just be trying to make it all a little bit better. I would love if you could just enlighten me a little bit and enlighten everybody else who's watching. What is the condition called and what have you been through? We know that you're a family man and I would love to know what your family's journey has been like with you through all of this and, and how amazing they must have been and being there with you. Um, my daughter was only two years old when I got diagnosed. The condition is called glioblastoma and it's a stage four brain tumor, malignant brain tumor. So it, even though they removed 100% of the visible parts of the tumor, they um, it can come back, so it's malignant. What has the experience of your wife and daughter been through this? Your uh, your your diagnosis and treatment and procedure, and what have been to keep you going? Yeah, I have to thank my wife because I do have some mental conditions and um, deficiencies. I guess is a better way, and uh, I couldn't really be where I'm at right now without my wife. Thank the Lord that you were able to go through the procedures you've been through and have the love of your family to be there and supporting you. I applaud all of you uh, wholeheartedly. And I have, but I have one more question. It's important. It's not as important as some of the other things, but I think maybe in some ways it's more important. We're both Laker fans. Our Lakers oh. won, baby. What did you do to celebrate the championship? What I did later that night was just look at all the news stories and the videos and and um, all the sportscasters kind of ca uh, talking about the game. So I enjoyed that. Um, Zach, what is your favorite color? Uh, I'd say like hot pink. Hot pink. Okay. Like my daughter, <laughs> especially in Southern California, you got to wear something colorful i mean except for what i'm wearing now but <laughs> i do have a pink t-shirt my oh, wife's favorite color is purple so i like your sweater I got, I got a little bit of that see i got a little bit of my pink and my purple on here well zach i uh honored and grateful to have this opportunity with you this was a very unique experience for me i haven't really talked to a celebrity like this one-on-one -on -one, and it could be the only one so even though i have memory issues um, i don't think i forget about you <laughs> well, bless you, man. It was a pleasure to meet you. God bless you, sending you and your family so much love and so much light. And may this continue to heal and may uh, your life continue to thrive. Thanks for watching This Ain't Your Average Talk Show, brought to you by the Creative Coalition. Now, back to our regularly scheduled programming.